Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, what is your story? We just sang, this is my story. Is it yours? I hope that it is. I would hope that your story, uh, certainly of coming to know Christ as Savior, that starts there. And, but that has continued, right? Certainly the idea of the story continuing. And um, uh, certainly after your salvation, certainly has been a good thing for the, you and the Lord and a good testimony. Uh, we, we sang some great songs there. Blessed Assurance, what a great old hymn that is. I love that song, Forever Rain. I like that song. That's certainly a, a contemporary a praise and worship, if you want to call it that. And, and again, the words are great. We love to sing out for him. And Miss Olivia, where are you? You're right over there. What a great song that was. Thank you for singing for us today. Amen. What a great job. If I'm not mistaken, I, again, you correct me. Was that your first time to sing with the piano or playing the piano? First time here. <laughs> I know what that means. Yeah. That's a great job. Thank you for singing for us. And uh, by the way, did you see who was playing the piano? Miss Sharon was playing the piano. That's a big deal. Uh, certainly recovering from her surgery and all that she's been through. How about that? And certainly a uh, great job on the piano. And did you notice who was preaching? Man, even before we get started, what a great job that is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're obviously thankful. We're glad that you're here. And, and I don't know what kind of gear you're in, but I'm in a, I'm in a good gear. Right? I love the Lord. I'm happy. I'm joyful to be here. I want to speak to you from Philippians. If you haven't turned to Philippians, go ahead and do so. And we want to do a, a, just a, um, a, a message here on a passage of Scripture that has been uh, part of our Wednesday night service the last couple of weeks. If you attend the Wednesday night, uh, we've been looking at this passage and, and it's been really good. We've been, verse 14 is probably the banner verse in this third chapter. And that's the one where Paul says, I press toward the mark, right? For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. I press toward the mark. Many people have used verse 14 as maybe a life's verse. Uh, it, it has been one of encouragement, direction, you know, focus, all those kind of things. Maybe the, the idea of sticking it out in times of hardship and suffering. And so certainly chapter 3 of Philippians is a great passage of Scripture. We, uh, by the way, if you don't attend Wednesday night and you have a free night or you're able to come, by the way, many of our folks uh, come uh, even straight from work or things like that. Uh, our Wednesday night for our adults is an adult Bible study. We break it down verse by verse. Honestly and personally, it's my most favorite service. I enjoy Wednesday nights. We, we're able just to kind of relax. We, we get down and, into some of the nitty gritty. We teach. We, we enjoy that very much. And, um, and so if you're available as an adult, we'd love to have you come be a part of our Wednesday night. I know it takes sacrifice. I know your lives are busy, uh, but it's worth your time. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's not worth your time because it's our church or I'm doing the teaching, uh, but it's worth your time because anytime you invest in the things of God, it's worth your time. I just what I believe. I don't think you'll go home void if you've in, uh, certainly genuinely invested your time into God's Word. I just don't think God will let you go home with nothing. And so it's worth your time to come and spend time together in God's Word. By the way, that's our Awana night for our children. Our Awana year has gotten off to just a great start. It's our Elevate Student Night. That's their big night together. They're doing great. Brother Daniel, Miss Heavily, the Humphreys are out there, Dallas and Sarah Tudor out there. And of course our kids, they're, they're doing great. And so Wednesday night is a very eclectic, fun, uh, busy, stressful. Uh, what else can we say about the night, right? It's a great night. So we invite you to come on Wednesday evenings. Everything starts at 7 p.m. We've been looking at this passage because as we talk about pressing, that's kind of been our focus on Wednesday night about pressing toward the mark. And the idea of to press and and to make sure that we're giving effort and to making sure we pursue. Matter of fact, if you're there in Philippians chapter 3, before we read the passage here, look in verse number 12. And I want to show you the same word as the word press, all right? It's found in verse number 12. Paul said, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. That's the word. I follow after. 
The word follow after in verse 12 and the word press in verse 14 are the same word. And it literally means to pursue, pursuing something. And I thought about uh, different ideas of pursuit and uh, what it means to, to push. And, um, and I would say this, first of all, this is a clear change from our past lost condition into our new saved condition with the Lord. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, not only is there none righteous, uh, but, but there is none that seeketh after God. Man inherently moves away from God. He doesn't move closer to God. Uh, John chapter 3, the great conversation uh, with Nicodemus there, and it's in that uh, third chapter about verse 18. We always talk about verse 16, but verse 18 through about verse 21 goes on and tells us that men loved darkness rather than light. God is a God of light. And rather than moving toward the light, men naturally gravitate towards darkness. We don't pursue God. We actually move away from God. But oh, God be thanked because he sought after us. Amen. You see, the idea, the blessed thing about the gospel is, is that you don't really naturally have to do anything yourself to be ready for the gospel. God has already pursued you to the point that he's presenting the gospel to you just the way you are today. And the beauty of that is that your pursuits, whatever you're pursuing today, whatever defines the motives of your life, in the end, pursuing God is the ultimate task. Amen. The ultimate joy. It's not just task, it's joy. To pursue God in heart, to pursue God in mind, to have God uh, create such a heart within us that we are absolutely joyful of the life that we now live. We're absolutely willing to serve God. And so that kind of change is an incredible change. And it clearly is different from before we were saved. So this idea of pressing or pursuing, clearly in verse 14, it states to pursue Christ. We have we press on toward the mark uh, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. So there's a high standard and clearly Paul as an example. He's like, you know what? I, I have pursuits. I, I want to push forward and push on to this idea of ser uh, reaching unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and I thought about a couple of things what it is to pursue, and I, it kind of puts it in perspective. Whatever you're pursuing, whatever it is, maybe you're pursuing a bachelor's degree. Uh, maybe you're pursuing a high school diploma, right? And by the way, I mean, growing up as a kid, you know, when I was in seventh grade, the high school diploma was a lifetime away. You know, that, that next six years was, my, was a lifetime. I thought, man, we are never gonna make 1989. <laughs> Lo and behold, here we are 30 years later. I could have been through the process two and a half more times. And I'm still young, you know. The thought of what we're pursuing, maybe you're pursuing the bachelor's degree. My wife pursued a bachelor's degree from home as a pastor's wife, as a mom, as a wife. Uh, and, and I remember uh, it was it was an interesting time in our house. It was her pursuits became all of our pursuits. <laughs> She's like, well, we were like, well, what's for dinner? I don't know. <laughs> I got to do class. I'm going to go do class. Leave me alone. <laughs> right. And by the way, it, it was it was legit. As a matter of fact, I was like, honey, you go. You go do your classes. We'll stay over here. <laughs> I praise the Lord. My, my, <laughs> I'm making fun of her. By the way, uh, I couldn't do what she did. I don't have those kind of pursuits. I'm too lazy. <laughs> right? The idea that, that we have pursuits, something that drives us to do better. I, I thought about, uh, how many of you guys have been on an airplane before? Been on an airplane? How many times you get in the airplane and you think, man, what, what, when is this thing taking off? Anybody like that? Liars. 
Right? Been in an airplane? Think, man, I've been sitting there for 30 minutes when this thing going to back out. That first little wiggle when the plane starts banging out. Okay, here we go. This is time to get in the air. Let's go on. And I remember, uh, when, when, well, when Brady has started the flight school, he wants to be a pilot, as most of you are aware. And I remember telling Brady, hey, you know, you're going to go be a pilot. I was like, hey, there ain't no shortcuts. You got to learn everything there is to learn, and you got to learn it well. You know, there ain't no sleeping in pilot's class. Because you get up there and you don't know what to do, that ain't going to end well. You know, learn it well, do well, be a good student and pursue it. And I remember when the next time I got in a plane, I'm like, man, I wish they would take all the time that they need to check the plane. Right? You with me? I mean, their pursuits. What it is to make sure that we're doing the right thing and rather than just worried about my time and my, you know, my 30 minutes in the seat waiting for the plane to take off. I told Brady just the other day, again, be the best student as a pilot you can possibly be. Make sure that you learn it all and learn it well. Take all the time that you need. I had to tell this story too about pursuits. I thought about this last night as I was just kind of reflecting. I, I got to tell a story on Jaden. And I just got her attention really well right there. Did you notice that? <laughs> Many of you know Jaden came to live with us about six or seven years ago. And, and uh, it was the summer that she just arrived. She got to us in May and, and um, it was in about July, I think. Our family decided to go take a little trip. We went to San Antonio and we went to Six Flags. What's the place called over there? Fiesta, Texas. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name of the place this morning. Uh, we went to Fiesta, Texas. Jaden is about eight, and I think she had a, she just turned nine, I think, right there at that same time. And and we were over there, and there, of course, uh, Fiesta, Texas. I think you guys were with us that day. I think we were together, Brother Mark. And, and so, uh, well, we, we want to ride a roller coaster. You guys remember this? Riding the roller coaster. How many of you remember riding your first roller coaster? How many of you still have not ridden a roller coaster? They like that? Chickens, right? Your chickens, what you? The first roller coaster, and, and of course my, my kids were like, oh, we're going to go ride the roller coaster. And, and Jane was like, I'm going to ride the roller coaster. So like, okay, well, have you ever ridden one before? No, I never ridden. I said, now, you gotta make, we, we were standing right there. Look, I mean, it goes up pretty high, and it's pretty fast, and it goes upside down, and it does all this. And she's like, no, I ain't got a problem. I can ride a roller coaster. I said, now, are you sure? Let's stand here and watch a couple of things go by, and let's make sure we get it right. You know, and we're standing there, and there goes the train. You know, she's like, ah, yeah, no problem. So now, are you sure? Let's make sure. Because, you know, again, if you've never been on your first roller coaster, then it, it's, a, it's a life-changing experience if you're not prepared. And so, now I've got, I'm, I'm going to ride a roller coaster. All right, well, who's going to ride with Jaden? We're going to make sure she's taken care of. You know, again, we're just kind of figuring out this new relationship. And Okay, so we get on the roller coaster. And, and I, I remember Mom and I, we didn't ride that time. And, and we got us standing out the outside. And, and uh, they went and rode the roller coaster. Did you ride it that day? No, you're like, no, I didn't ride it either. I didn't ride it either. But they get on the roller coaster, our kids, and, and they're, you know, gone for a few minutes, you know, in the line. And then the, the cart, you know, the, here goes the train by. And they get off the roller coaster. Here come, you know, my kids are bounding. Ha, that was great. Jaden's like, ha, 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 ha. Oh, that was terrible. That's the worst experience of my life. And I was like, what? She's like, that was so scary. I said, we told you it was scary. <laughs> and it was one of those moments, her pursuits. I mean, she was pursuing that roller coaster. And I've come to learn through the years that it had nothing to do with the roller coaster. It was everything to do with somebody else telling her what to do. <laughs> God love Jaden. By the way, she's ridden many roller coasters since then, I believe. And uh, she came out crying that day. And my, my wife and I, it was one of those moments... If you know our family at all, and, and just the dynamics of our family, we, um, we're, we're, uh, we're about this much merciful and loving <laughs> when it comes to situations like that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> mom was like, I told you not to get on the roller coaster. Don't come crying to me, you know, one of those did. <laughs> By the way, how many of you feel that way? <laughs> Be honest. I told you not to get on there, you got on there anyway, and so now you're bawling, so don't come crying to me, you know. And I was like, well, okay, come here, you know. I'm like, oh, I mean, she just got to us, right? We're, we're a month or two into this thing, and uh, it'll be okay. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's not, we love you, Jay, but that's funny. 
with my arm around him. Now, by the way, you may be appalled to think that pastor guy is, is just a loser. Well, I'm here to tell you, in our family, when you do something like that and you pursue something like that and it, it causes you whatever, we're going to laugh at you. That's just kind of how we are. In Jesus' name, of course. That's right. It become a lesson eight years later in the morning service. Jaden, you know we love you. By the way, those stories... By the way, you know, my kids know, I tell those stories because I'm a preacher, I have to come up with a story. And yet, it applies. You ever had a pursuit that in the end didn't turn out well for you? I mean, you ever had something that maybe scared you in the process? By the way, my kids know I love them. They know we love them dearly and, and all that. Again, I genuinely felt sorry for Jaden that day. And by the way, there's been other pursuits in our family that cost us a little bit. There have been other pursuits during the life of our family that my kids or my, myself or Missy or, our, you know, whatever, that when it's all said and done, we, we kind of walk away. We're scared to death. It's like, what in the world just happened? And, you know, we, we would choose not to do that again if we had the choice. But, but so here, here's the question to kind of start off. What are you pursuing? Well, what are you pressing toward? What is it that's captured your heart to the point that you got your foot on the gas, no matter what anybody else is saying, that this is the pursuit of my heart that I will pursue? Now, in the end, if Paul were here this morning, I think Paul would, uh, Paul would tell us today, hey, come on, this is the way to go. Let's go this way. Is it scary? Of course it's scary. Is it hard? Of course it's hard. Right? Is, is there other problems in life that are challenging to that? Of course there are. But this is the pursuit of all pursuits to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, not everybody's doing it. Not everybody's doing it. By the way, it took me until I was about 14 to ride my first roller coaster. And uh, I rode the Orient Express in Kansas City, Missouri. By the way, I got to the end of the line. I fixed to get on the, on the train, and there was the exit. I was like, I'm going for the exit. And I probably would have done it, but above the door it said chicken exit. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, that is just mean, whoever did that. And by the way, there is no 14-year-old boy who's taking the chicken exit. No way, no how. We got on that roller coaster, and we were scared to death. But here's the thing. What is it that you're pursuing? Paul would say this pursuit is the pursuits of all pursuits. But what's interesting about the passage, you see, you see the, the, uh, the, the, the title of the message this morning is the prerequisites. I mean, what, what, what is it that's necessary to make sure we have kind of in line or in order, in order to pursue God in a way that would be beneficial to our life? To have a pursuit that is just ignorant. You know, that doesn't have some information or knowledge or to, to pursue a, a goal or, or a, something that would not be right before God. I mean, some people are pursuing things that are before God is evil and sinful. So to make sure that we have the prerequisites down in order to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. There are four or five here that I think Paul begins to point out to us. Let's consider now. Let's pick it up in verse number seven. And let's read down to verse number 14. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb. What an incredible statement. I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained or have arrived, either were already perfect, but I pursue, I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus." 
Brethren, I count not now myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, capture that, this one thing I do, I, if I forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What a great passage of scripture. Paul again points out four or five things here that I would simply suggest as prerequisites for pursuit. Paul said, I, I press toward this mark. But for me to get to this point, there's been several things kind of fall into place that really need to kind of be there. First of all, let's talk about verse 7 and 8, which is to pro providing that we have freed ourselves of unnecessary things we are able to pursue. We're able to pursue, providing we have rid ourselves and freed ourselves of unnecessary things. Now, now that sounds kind of funny. Verse 7 and 8, he talks about his previous life. Verse 7, he says, I, you know, those things that I counted as excellency for myself, I ultimately counted them as loss. Well, what I thought was important to begin with, now is no longer important to me. Well, what I counted as something that was the pursuits of life, they now are no longer important unto me. Verse 8 goes a step further and he says and suggests in verse 8 that their equivalent is that of dung. By the way, what an what a incredible idea. By the way, who says the Bible's boring? Right? Everything that I had accumulated in life. Now, if you read back a few verses, he talks about his credentials. He talks about his life before Christ. He says he was a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, which meant, by the way, if you were a Pharisee, you had to memorize the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and there's another one in there I missed. Numbers, number five. Right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? The idea that you had to memorize those things. And Paul said, you know what? That ultimately is now something that I consider as waste. And by the way, let's capture Paul's heart here. He's not saying that Moses' books are waste. He's simply suggesting that the value he placed in what he took for himself in those books was now waste. Well, the, the, what I thought was important and what I was and who I was before all that now, now he says, you know, it's just a loss. None of that matters because now I want to pursue Christ in everything I do. There are things in your life that are probably unnecessary. Now, let me kind of qualify this as well so we don't get off track. I'm not talking about coming to Christ in salvation. Let me make an important distinction here. By the way, you do not correct yourself in order to be saved. There's nothing you can do to prep yourself, right, to be worthy enough to save. That, that's all happens on God's side. That's God telling you that I save you just as you are. But now that you're saved, now that you know Christ as your Savior, there are things that can become hindrances to your life. There are trusts, there are beliefs possibly, there are, you know, maybe family credentials potentially. Things that no, no doubt are fleshly things, worldly things, that in and of themselves may not even be sin. And yet they're the hindrances to your life. They're the things that are hindering you from pursuing God. Because in your life, they take up such a dominant place and a dominant part of the pursuits of your life that it's almost impossible for you to pursue God because of these unnecessary things. Now, Paul made it very clear that what I used to count as gain now is lost. Now, by the way, we're, again, you kind of in, uh, apply this to your life. I cannot apply to every one of you in your specific need. This is where the Holy Ghost has to come into play because, because whatever it is, and you know better than anybody else what these unnecessary things are. I remember when I was in college, uh, in Bible college, my, my mentor, uh, Brother Miser was his name. He was a fantastic pastor. He was a fantastic mentor to me. 
And he would, I remember we would go down on the weekends from college about 60 miles away and we would spend the weekend at the church. I was the youth pastor and the music director. And, uh, and on Saturdays we would go down and we would maybe go visit people. We, would, we built a building while we were there. We might do physical work. Uh, we might go on an activity with young people. Whatever needed to be done, we would do it. And, um, but there were a lot of Saturdays I would say, Brother Miser, will you just talk to me? And we would sit down. I remember one day specifically, we were in what we would consider our fellowship hall, and all the chairs and tables were put away. And he literally sat down on the floor with me there in the fellowship hall. And I remember in my, uh, in my youthful excitement and, and ignorance and, and probably some pride, I asked him one day, I said, now, Brother Miser, I'm, I'm serious and I want you to be open. I said, what do you see in me that what may hinder me being able to move forward for the Lord Jesus Christ? He didn't wait three seconds. He was kind, but boy, he was precise. He said, well, Andy, here's what I see. And he just laid it out for me. And, and it was like a, it was like a, a surgery of, a, of an expert doctor. I mean, it was hurt, you know, it was painful. But, but after I thought about it, and it, you know, that hurt kind of turns into some emotions. I'm thinking, well, I mean, you see all that in me right now? Who are you? And then the Lord, the Lord was like, well, Andy, you asked him. I was like, yeah, I did, didn't I? And I really meant it. I want you to tell me what you see. And he told me. Do you know to this day, I have never forgotten what he told me? And do you know to this day, it still plays a part in my everyday pursuits? It still plays a part in my life that God said, Andy, this is the thing right there. If you're not careful, that's an unnecessary thing that is not even sinful. That if you're not careful, it'll change the pursuits of your heart to move you away from God rather than toward God. And to this day, 30 years later, 25 years later, it still plays a part in my everyday life. Now here's the thing, God, God can tell you there are some things that you thought were important that are no longer important that if you're not careful they'll hinder you pursuing and pressing toward God. And many of those things are not issues, again, necessarily uh, of confessing sin. They're, they're not, we're not talking about sins, you know, uh, you're previous to salvation, we're talking about now that you're saved. They are fleshly, they are maybe worldly, they are things that don't matter in the pursuits of God, and ultimately they need to change. They need to change. How about a second point? Number nine, or verse number nine, Paul said, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. How about point number two? We are able to pursue, provided we have the righteousness of God by faith. What that means is simply this. You're ready for a profound idea? There's no way to pursue God unless you're saved. Can I get an amen on that? There's no way to pursue God unless you're saved. So let me, let me throw it out there here really quick and very kind. that there, I honestly believe there are a lot of people today in church that are very frustrated with their walk with God. But if you boil it all right down to the core of the issue, it could be and probably is many times an issue of salvation. Please understand. And we, we say it so regularly but, and so simply, but it is profound. Listen to this. Baptism does not save you. It does not save you. I've had so many people through the years, tell me about when you got saved. Well, I was baptized when I was. And honestly, I, with, with trying to be kind, I didn't ask when you got baptized. I want to know when you got saved. By the way, that thief that died on the cross right next to our Savior was never baptized. But the Lord himself said to that man, today you'll be with me in paradise. So many people are confused about the issues of baptism and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe the issue of salvation is based on church attendance. Maybe it's based on the particular church that you attend. By the way, some, some churches actually teach that if you're not a member of their church, you're not going to heaven. By the way, you don't find that anywhere in the Scripture. Nowhere in the Scripture. Church membership does not save you. Right? Being Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic, none of that saves you. 
What saves you is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And so this issue, Paul said, I, 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 there's no way that I can follow after and pursue if I have found righteousness in my own ability. If I think I'm good enough. You know, it doesn't matter how many good things you think you've done. God said, until you're saved, they are all as filthy rags and they mean nothing to God. So the concept that we are saved and have, have the righteousness of God through Christ. How about point number three? Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, Paul goes on and says, that I may know him. One reason for the righteousness of Christ and being saved is that I may know him. And the power of this resurrection, the fellowship, uh, this suffering is being made conformable unto his death. By the way, the idea of pursuing God is provided I am willing to endure the journey itself. Why did you get saved? You know, I mean, it's one thing to be saved because you don't want to go to hell. But the larger issue for the believer is that we become to learn that our salvation is so much more than just escaping hell. Can I get an amen on that? You see, by the way, there's nothing wrong with escaping hell. And, and even the last breath of an individual, they evidently have the capacity and ability by God to tell God, I choose you. But the beauty of the Christian life is much more than just escaping the flames of hell. The beauty of the Christian life is that now that I'm saved, there's a way of living life that is way better and so much more th more in my life than just escaping hell. And Paul said, I, I have the righteousness of Christ that I may know him. I want to know Christ. I, I believe right here is the crux of the issue for so many people who claim Christ as Savior as to whether they pursue him or not. Many people who claim Christ as Savior are merely content to kind of go through the motions of life. We're content to show up at church every once in a while. We're content to ask a prayer request when we need it. We're content maybe to offer a little bit of money in the offering plate when it comes by. You know, whether or not we're actually doing our tithe and missions or other things, but we give a little bit of money and we, we show when we do, we sing a couple of verses of songs we don't like. <laughs> and in the end, we walk out the door thinking, man, I have done God a favor. When the reality is there's so much more to it. Paul said, the reason why I have been made righteous is that I might know him. That I might know him. That I might learn to love him and know his heartbeat and know his thinking and know all there is that he will let me know in life. Now, Paul gives some qualifiers in verse number 10. Why? That I may know him, right? The power of resurrection. The power of resurrection. The idea that we would understand the power of daily living. The power of daily living is found in the power of Christ and the yieldedness of your heart unto God. Let me try to illustrate just for a, a moment because it's so important. We wake up and we go through the redundancy of every day. Every day, right? We just kind of go through it. It comes so fast, it seems like. And we just go through the same things time after time. And Paul said, I have been made the righteousness of Christ that I might know Christ. And what that means is I want to know what it is in the power of resurrection on a daily basis. I want to live life differently than I used to live. I don't want the same attitudes I used to have. I don't want the same critical spirit I used to have. Let's just be honest. The one mark of those who are lost is criticism. The one mark of Christians who are in the tour before God is criticism. We're, so, we're walking the door, we're looking at everybody else. We come to church and we think it's our ministry to find the problems. Well, I all know teenagers got problems. Right? We think it's our ministry to be critical and to look at people and say, let me find out who you are. Oh, I found Luke. Luke's got so many issues. I'm just kidding. 
right? We, we think that's kind of how Christian life is supposed to be. No, no, no. No, no, no. Why don't you come in and be critical of yourself? And investigate where you're not like the Lord. And investigate. By the way, we're not talking about moving our stance on truth. You hear that now? We're not talking about changing our stance on truth. Sin is still sin. That, that's, that's a really good cue for an amen right there. Amen. See, sin is still sin because we're not, we're not talking about changing the standards of God when it comes to right and wrong. But we are talking about changing a spirit within to live a powerful resurrected life that though you've got problems and so do I, we can all still press toward the mark of Christ. Amen. And we can do it together. I mean, who doesn't have problems? Right? I mean, who doesn't have problems? Start with a preacher. Lord knows the deacons got problems. <laughs> That's why preachers' kids are as bad as they are, because the deacons' kids. Yeah, you're with me on that. I mean, everybody's got problems. The question is not about your problems. The question is about your pursuits. What are you willing to endure? The power of resurrection. Notice what else he says there, verse ten: the fellowship of suffering. Part of the endurance of the journey is simply to enjoy the journey itself. And that sometimes means it's hard. That sometimes means it's not always comfortable and cozy. Sometimes you go through things you don't understand. I thought about, again, Miss Sharon, you're right here on the front row this morning. Miss Sharon was painting her kitchen, as we all know. Do you like the color, by the way? <laughs> it was a pretty costly color, wasn't it? By the way, I, there's none of us anywhere in the world that would wish that on anybody else. But the last year and a half has been hard. It's been tough. Brother Dwight, you just came through what you came through. Some of you have lost loved ones. And you don't understand. Some of you have just been diagnosed with problems and okay, medical issues. Some of you have got all kinds of financial problems. It doesn't matter the problem. The question is, are you willing to be a partner with God in the middle of that issue? Hang in there. Don't give up. It's a mark. I've got your foot on the gas toward Christ. Some, some of us are willing at the moment of hardship, we just bail. We're just not willing. And Paul said, I, I've made, been made righteous for a reason, that I may understand the power of resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Notice what else he says, verse 10, being made conformable unto his death. I thought about that for a long time through the years. What does it mean to be made conformable unto his death? By the way, first of all, what he does not mean is dying on a cross. Not literally dying on a cross. But to follow Christ also means you take, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. The concept that we are willing to lay down our life for those around us. John says it this way, No greater love hath any man than this, that a man lay down his life for his who? For his friends. No greater love has any man than this than a man will lay down his life for his friends. Question for you. Have you got your foot on the gas and willing to lay down your life for somebody else? What are you willing to do for Christ that somebody else may benefit from your sacrifice? I didn't say this a while ago. And I probably should have. And the Lord brings it to my mind right now. We, uh, we took on three new missionaries. I challenged our church to financially give and I want you to know something. In the last month and a half, uh, we average about $1,000 a week missions. We've been averaging that for some time. $52,000 a year missions income. In the last month and a half, our missions giving is up 50%. $1,500 a week. Now, now, you know what that tells me? Some of you can give. And you haven't been. That's what that tells me. By the way, I don't care about your money. Money's money, numbers are numbers, right? We can make numbers do whatever. And, and, and again, you're not giving your money to me, by the way. Your money goes to the missionary. But here's the thing. Are you willing to put a few dollars down that somebody in Costa Rica might hear the gospel of Christ? I mean, are you willing to go to Australia with Brother Richards? We're only 2% claim Christ at all. And you're willing to give a little bit of money that somebody in Australia might have a chance to hear the gospel of Christ. Are you willing to go to the Navajo Nation? 
place marked by drugs and, 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 and crime and all kinds of things. And, and yet there's Brother Merritt hanging in there for 30 years, 30 years, serving God in a place who's living on a, on a dime budget. And where the Navajo people might hear the gospel of Christ. Are we willing to give a little bit of money? Now, by the way, most of us, Brother Kelsey said it right last week, most of us writing a number on a check to give to missions is but a little bitty drop in the ripple effect of our life. Are you with me on that? Some of us can give and support a missionary ourselves. $150 a week we started, Brother, e, Brother Richards and Brother Bramer and Brother Merritt. $150 a month, that's what, $35 a week, $40 a week? Some of us could do that and never think twice. And support an entire missionary, just ourselves, And it wouldn't create a ripple in our finances. Now, by the way, I'm not, I'm not harping on money. The point is this, how much do we really suffer? Paul said, I, I want to get involved and I want my foot on the gas to the point that I literally feel my pursuits and I feel it in my heart and in my life. Or the fellowship of suffering being made conformable unto his death. I want what I do to matter. And I want it to matter to God because I know if it matters to God, it'll matter for God's purpose. And I want that to matter. Well, you can pursue provided we are willing to enjoy the journey. It may include some suffering, some, some conformable death, laying our life on the line, whatever the sacrifice. And finally we come to this idea that we are able to pursue provided I am willing to lay hold of God's purpose. Look in verse number 12. Verse number 12. Not as though it already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after if I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of God. I asked my dad one day when I was about 15, 16 years old, we were riding in the car together, and I had surrendered to the ministry at that point, and I was trying to wrap my brain around what that meant. And I've uh, been trying ever since, I think. And uh, I said, Dad, I said, why... Why did God leave us here when he saved us? Why didn't he want to go on to heaven? I mean, that'd be so much better. God could do anything he wants to do. God can snap his fingers and the whole world be saved. I mean, God has the power to do whatever he chooses. I said, why does a God do it when we get saved? Why don't we just go on to heaven? And my dad, in his sim simple way, he was so, you know, not a lot of words, just straight to the point. He said, well, Andy, he said, because God uses us to tell other people. And it just blew my mind. <laughs> I'm 15 year old. They didn't mind, you know, picking up parts and pieces of my brain. And my dad, in a few words, I was like, okay, I get it. Paul said, I, I press on that I may grab a hold, apprehend that for which also I have been apprehended by God. God saved you for a reason. God saved you to save you. But he saved you to help save someone else. He saved you that your life might be given for a bigger purpose. And by the way, isn't it funny how our life becomes about so many purposes other than the one that God intended? We live in America, we live in Houston, and our life is daylight to dark, seemingly for everything that won't matter for eternity. By the way, yeah, again, I, I, I understand, please understand my heart here, I, I, we have to work. But please understand, your engineering firm is not going to be in heaven. Your doctor's practice, of which you may be a nurse, a doctor, it's not going to be in heaven. The barber shop of which you cut hair, right? The grocery store in which you check out groceries, none of that's going to be in heaven. What's going to be in heaven is only those who Christ has saved. That's it. Now, by the way, I'm not knocking engineering firms and barber shops and grocery stores and whatever else. We, we have to do that. But let's be honest. Our world and the culture in which we live, it just sucks every minute out of our day. And what little time we have left, we don't feel like giving it to a bigger cause. We just don't feel like doing it. 
We come home from work and I'm just dog tired. I'm not concerned about my neighbor. I'm not concerned about the visitors that showed up Sunday. I'm not concerned, right? I'm just not thinking about so and so. And I'm just not interested. We're so concerned about all, all these things. And God said, Paul said, I, there's one thing keeping me from pressing the, the gas pedal is because until I can lay hold of why I have been saved, until I can put my hands around the purpose of God, until then I know what it is to press toward the mark for the prize of God. Well, that, that challenges my heart. I, again, my heart is this. Am, am I pursuing? I would like to think that I got my foot on the gas. I would like to think that I'm the one pressing on and pre pressing forward and pursuing. But there may be some things. There may be some things. Verse 13 talks about our final point, and We're able to pursue provided I'm willing to stretch and be stretched. Verse 13, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forth. I reach forth. By the way, I'm, a, I'm portly enough. You with me on this? I'm portly enough that when I drop something on the ground, it's a far reach. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That floor is getting further away every day. Come on now, you with me? And I reach. That's the concept. How far are you willing to make yourself vulnerable to reach for something that you consider valuable? By the way, I would venture to say, uh, again, just a, a silly illustration. If I drop my toothpick on the floor, I'm not bending over. <laughs> I'm going to get me another one. I'll sweep it up with a broom and a, and a dustpan. Amen. The dustpan that has the extension handle on it, right? <laughs> if I drop my $100 bill, I'll get on my knees for it if I have to. <laughs> By the way, I might do that for a $10 bill. <laughs> I might even do it for a $5 bill. I might do it for a $1 bill. I guess I would. Not a penny. I'm not ready. It cost me too much more than a penny. Amen. You, 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 here's the thing. Paul said, I, I forget those things are behind. And I, I reach forth. I, I reach out as far as I can reach. I made myself vulnerable. And it hurts a little bit to reach out and grab a hold of something that I've never had in my hands before. Question, how far are you willing to reach? Are you willing to reach to the point that it hurts? Are you willing to reach to the point that you're vulnerable? I think that's the bigger issue. My wife and I laugh a little bit because now we're kind of of the age a little bit. And, and again, I'm portly enough that if I reach far enough, it could be embarrassing. You guys know what I'm talking about? Fall on my face. Remember, I live in the family. If you fall down, we're going to laugh as long as you're okay. So there's risk involved. There's risk involved. And Paul said, how far is too far to reach? That I can pursue God as long as I'm willing to be stretched. How about this one? And I know my time is up, but we're past time. Are, are you willing to go to Australia? Are you willing to go to Costa Rica? You know, Brother Bramer, Brother Chad, Miss Jennifer, you know, they're just normal people. They're just like you and me. That's the beauty of missionaries. That they're just like us. But God's asked them to do something beyond their capacity. And they're willing to go do it. They're just willing to go. That's what's so insatiable and so energizing and so exciting for us as a church. Because we see a couple who's like, you know what? I'm willing to go live in the mountains of San Jose, Costa Rica. I don't know anybody. And I'm not there for the climate. I'm not there for the scenery. I'm there to try to tell Costa Ricans about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's something about that kind of reaching that is insatiable and exciting for us. The question is, why won't you be the one to reach? Why not you? And why not me? Paul said, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward for those things which are before. And I press. I pursue the mark of Christ. Well, so do you have the prerequisites down? 
things that have to really be in place before you can really pursue. By the way, let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you saved? Do you know Christ as Savior? If you're here this morning and you're not saved, listen to me. God makes it so very simple. The simplicity of the gospel. That based on what Christ did on Calvary, dying for the world, shedding his own personal blood on Calvary, that provided a way for the entire world, whosoever, to be saved. And that includes you. The Bible makes it so, so very clear that if you'll believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So is that you this morning? Is that the hindrance that's keeping you back? If it is, then please be safe today. Be safe today. Maybe it's some unnecessary thing. Maybe it's some unnecessary. Maybe you're not willing to endure the journey. Maybe the journey itself was a little more difficult than you thought. It's a matter of faith of trusting the Lord. Maybe there's some issue of, of you know, reaching out. Maybe you're just afraid to be vulnerable. Maybe the issue of just telling God, I'm okay with whatever you decide. Whatever you decide. I'm okay with that. My prayer is simply this. I know I've gone a little long today. You know me. My prayer is simply this, that if God is telling you and pointing something out, God says right there, that's the issue right there that's keeping you from pushing on the gas, then, then my question is really simple. Why would we not run to the altar and ask God for help? Why would we not do that? And I would venture to say this, there's not a one of us probably in some of these points that doesn't need to come to the altar. Not a one. So with that thought in mind, let's ask the Lord. Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, we thank you for the example of Paul. Father, we thank you for the challenges, Lord, before us. We pray that we'll look into our hearts. Father, what is it that's keeping us back? Father, what is it that's holding me from pushing on the gas and pursuing you at a higher level? Father, I pray that you'd look into our hearts. Show us what it is. And Father, let us be willing to respond. Let us be willing to come to you and seek your face. Father, I pray for those who may be lost today. May today be a day of salvation. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's